So I guess this is happening. So sit down, please. No. <laughs> so my name is Caleb. Um, I know Danny because I worked with her at CCAD. And uh, the reason why I'm up here tonight um, doing this um, is not because it's something that I do usually or have ever actually done. Um, but like most people, I saw someone do it on TV and I thought I could probably do it, right? <laughs> and then I made the mistake of telling Danny that I was thinking about doing stand-up. And um, if you know her, she was just like, oh my gosh, you'll be so funny. You're so great. It's awesome. You're so good, right? Um, just please do it at my show. And then so I said, okay. And then um, I realized afterwards that I would have to like actually write some stuff and do some different things, right? So um, the reason the show that I was watching that made me think that I could do it, it was called uh, Crashing on HBO. Yeah, so we know, some people know it, right? Good. Um, for the people that don't know about it, um, basically it follows this comedian named Pete Holmes. Um, and Pete grew up like really Christian, really religious, and then um, wanted to be this comedian. And then him and his wife... Um, go through a divorce separation and then he's like dating and being really socially awkward because he was raised really Christian and then also he's just this really anxious person um, and so I saw that and I was like that seems pretty much exactly like me and uh, so I figured I could probably just you know go on stage and, and do the same thing um, right now though I feel like my anxiety is like a little bit high and usually that'll calm down in like 15 minutes so if we can all just kind of sit and just wait it out. It'll be better for all of us. And also, if you don't look at me, that helps, too. So like I said, uh, me and Pete, we were raised... Oh, also, I'm allowed to call him Pete. Um, me and Pete, we were raised really super Christian. Um, and that's always like a hard thing to kind of distinguish because a lot of people were raised really religious, right? They you know, went to church a lot and... Uh, or different religions, right? Um, but the, I guess the distinguishing factor, one of them at least, sometimes we all get together and we talk about what shows we weren't allowed to watch, right? Which is um, quite a bit. Um, <laughs> it's a little bit easier to watch what, or talk about what shows you were allowed to watch, really. Um, but the thing for me was that I just actually believed it for a really, really long time. And so that's what I think about as kind of like making me um, raised really religious is I just bought the story for, um, you know, probably like 20 some years of my life. And it sort of like infiltrated everything that I thought about and everything that I did. Um, and it really was hard because like, I thought God was like super scary. Um, but, but he also loved me. And it was this really, my family would be like, oh, God loves you so much. And so I tell him, I know, I know, I know, I know. Um, and then I'd be like, but I got to do all this stuff that he told me to do. Well, he didn't tell me to do. He told these people like thousands of years ago in a different language and a different culture that was in different life, completely different from mine. Um, but if I do those things, then he'll love me, right? I'm like, no, it's this unconditional love. Just everything in your life is just for you. And, I, and, and then I was like, yeah, but if I don't love him back, if I don't believe in him, then I'm just going to be like tortured for eternity. That feels like a condition, right? And so I kind of walked around my life with this uh, idea of this like big kind of bearded white guy, because that's what he looks like in all the pictures, right? Um, behind me and just kind of like watching everything that I do with this sort of like look, and he would kind of smile or frown depending on what I was doing, if it was like right or wrong. Um, so that was just always happening, okay? And then the other thing that was really scary um, about being raised really Christian was the idea of the rapture. And I don't know, actually I'm going to switch, I want to stand up. That feels better, yeah. Yeah, I was listening to my body. Good, good, yeah. What if I stood like this, right? This, this would match, like, my whole entire vibe, right? Like, this really, like, power stance. Like, if you see me, you're not going to, like, imagine that I'm going to walk someplace and be like, what's up? <laughs> All right. Okay. What was I saying? Oh, yeah, the rapture. Um, good. So, uh, if you don't know what the rapture is... The rapture is this thing that happens at the end of times, right? Um, and the story goes that Jesus is going to come back on these like big clouds, and there's going to be trumpets, and everybody that's saved just disappears instantly. 
okay? Um, everybody that isn't saved, they get to stay around to deal with like the Antichrist and all these horrible trials and tribulations. Um, so it's good if you're a Christian because you just disappear and everything's okay. The scary part about for Christians is, as they told this other part, where some people think that they're saved, but then when the rapture happens, they're not actually saved and they're left behind, okay? Um, and so I was always afraid that, afraid that maybe I wasn't like one of those saved ones, right? And so um, the rapture was going to happen and then I was going to be left and I would have to face the Antichrist. And essentially what happens then is if you profess that you believe in God, then you get like murdered with like a guillotine. Um, this is just in some of the Left Behind books. I don't know if you've read them. Um, I have all of them. <laughs> uh, and so as a little kid, I mean, probably like five, six, like I knew this story, right? And I was allowed to watch all these movies about the rapture and getting murdered for being a Christian and read all these books, um, but I wasn't allowed to watch the Smurfs <laughs> uh, because there was, like, magic in there. Uh, so, I don't know. I kind of wish I was allowed to watch the Smurfs. Um, I'm allowed to now, but... <laughs> but I don't because I don't watch TV. No. That's going to take too long. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, the only other hard part about growing up Christian, probably the, the hardest part, was puberty. Um, thanks, Lisa. <laughs> um, no, it was like, I, I guess I was thinking about it as they were talking about the, the five love languages and then the sixth one being music. I think for Christians, the seventh one would be like holding hands during prayer because that can get pretty hot. Um, I can always, I remember like just trying to like line up next to the right person. Like when it's like, oh, they're getting ready to pray. So let's get kind of close and then act really surprised when you end up next to them. You're like, oh, <laughs> You know, um, and then the eighth would be like the eighth love language would be waiting. You know, till marriage, right? Um, <laughs> so uh, my church didn't talk about sex that much, right? They didn't. They didn't say too much about it. They would just talk about like they say like um, sex is this beautiful gift from God that's only beautiful between a married man and a woman. And if you do it at any other time, it's gross and it's dirty and you're going to go to hell and you're going to be, you're going to burn, right? Um, but they didn't say that too often. Um, and so by that time, I was starting to question things a little bit more, right, as, uh, as teenagers do. And I can remember like raising my hand and saying, but, but why are we, why were we created to go through puberty at such like at this young age? Like, why does my body want to do this? Why is it like so hard to not like, have sex? Why would God do this to us, right? Why can't we have sex? And then they'd just be like, because God said so. And I'd say, okay. And then I would sort of, like, drift off into fantasy land, um, trying to plan out that evening's masturbatory experience. Uh, which we weren't supposed to do either. Um, actually, they talked a lot more about that, right? I think that they had realized that they'd probably screwed most of us up enough that we were these bizarre, socially awkward teenage boys that, like, the idea of actually having sexual intercourse was, like, very, very, like, out there, right? <laughs> like, I mean, it was pretty hard to talk to girls at that point. Um, kind of still is. Um, and so they would talk about, like, n not doing that. So there was this always this really difficult experience for me, right? Like, on the one hand, my body like 100% absolutely loved it, a lot. And uh, on the other hand, I had this like bearded guy behind me like watching me the whole time and just making these really sad faces, right? And so I'm like feeling good about it, but it's just like then I see God just like crying and like he's upset with me. And so as soon as I would be done, like, you know, before even being able to enjoy it, I'd have to be, like, asking for forgiveness, right, and apologizing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I don't, you know, I'll never do it again, but I, I knew that I would. But, um, and then God would kind of smile, and then he would love me again, and it would be okay. But the thing that, the part, the part that was, like, the hardest for me was this idea, like, I was really afraid that the rapture was going to happen while I was masturbating. And so it would be, like, in the middle of the sin, right, and then... It would happen, and then I'd just be kind of left behind with my pants down around my ankles. Um, so sometimes in order to, like, get through that fear, I would ask for forgiveness before, right? And just be like, hey, uh, I'm sorry for what I'm about to do. I really want to do it, and, like, you can turn away and not watch if you don't 
want to, um, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And that would really set the mood, you know, <laughs> like just really like bringing it into the, the end of the space. Um, and then other times though, I would just kind of like let the hormones take over and I would sort of like have this race against the rapture clock. Um, and I always beat it. <laughs> Yeah, good, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the rapture was really scary. So, um, I don't know, people were always like, how'd you get out of this religion, right? Because I was in like, Christian high school, Christian college, um, you know, was on that path. Um, family was wanting me to be a preacher. And I wish I had this really cool story about kind of like what caused me to kind of be able to make some of these jokes without being really scared. I'm a little bit scared still. Um, and I guess like, you know, I want this cool story, like maybe I was at this festival and these like hippies gave me acid and I took it and I just sort of, you know, so the sky opened up and I had this transcendent experience and I realized it's all about love. That didn't happen. Um, or I had some near-death experience in which it just became really clear to me like what the purpose of life was. Um, but the reality is, is like my story's really kind of boring. Like I just read some books by like people that weren't Christians. And... And when I did that, I started like realizing there's a lot of different stories from a lot of different people throughout the ages, all these different cultures, right? And I realized that I had been kind of told this one story for so long. And it was my parents' story, and it was my grandparents' story. Um, and I had just kind of bought into it. And I was kind of like, man, I just really want to create my own story, right? I don't want to have to like hear these old stories anymore that were written thousands of years ago for people in like a different language, right? Um, and, and then also I had started dating this girl. Um, somehow, and I was like really kind of concerned that my race against the rapture clock was going to negatively impact my sexual performance with her, and it did. Um, <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> so, um, so, so basically, right? I get out of this story, and then I go into the next story, which is um, that kind of me and Pete ended up doing together, right? As we uh, got married at a pretty young age, right, and kind of did that thing. Um, and then, like, you know, the coin toss, 50% uh, of the people, it doesn't really work out. Me and Pete, it didn't work out. Um, not me and Pete weren't together. Sorry. They said that kind of weird. Um, it didn't work out for either of us, right? And we found ourselves in this, like, modern dating world, which kind of feels like a jungle to me, uh, especially being raised Christian and not being allowed to date and then getting married and then, like, now being thrust out here, right, where it's just, like, all this swiping and, like, seeing people, um, so I think these like online dating apps are pretty fascinating. That's not like a good point. I just need some water. But what I really like about them are um, the bios, right? Like where people talk about themselves and they say like what it is that they... Um, think of themselves, what it is they want, and like more specifically, what it is that they don't want, which is weird to me a little bit, like just to have a whole list of things that they don't want. Um, but it really gave me like this, like a lens into kind of culture um, that, that I wasn't a part of, right? And one of the things that was really fascinating is just how fascinated people are with like death and murder and like these true crime podcasts and movies and shows Right? Like everybody, like, like, I feel like 50% of the bio is like, oh, I love true crime. Um, and probably like three or four of the dates that I went on, within like the first 15 minutes, they were making jokes about either me murdering them or them murdering me. And it was like, I was just kind of thinking, I was like, man, like, listen, I, I used, to, like, probably just a couple years ago, I was afraid I was going to burn forever in hell for just even orgasming. So I'm not really thinking about murdering you. Um, <laughs> But yeah, and then, and then so they'd be like watching all these shows and being like freaking out all the time and then we'd be talking and it'd be going really well, right? Um, as you can tell, I'm probably really like engaging and like people are really into me on these dating apps. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and so then I'd be like, hey, you want to like get together, right? You want to meet up? And then they'd wait for a little bit and they'd be like, I don't know, I'm pretty nervous. Plus you kind of look like Charles Manson. And so I'd be like, one, stop watching all these like murder shows and maybe you won't be freaking out about everybody else. And two, I do not look like Charles Manson. Like not every white guy with a beard looks the same. And not all of us are bad, right? Um, 
the other thing that was really fascinating to me is this uh, people that are really into grammar on the apps, right? It's like they want to have, they want their partner to have good grammar. Because like, that's what's really important in like this romantic relationship, right? Another one of the love languages is like correct grammar. <laughs> like I'm really like into people like being kind and genuine and like I want someone with like a soul connection, but I don't really care. And the other thing about gra the grammar that they want that I'm seeing on there, it's not complex grammar. It's like third grade grammar. Like they want to know the difference between like there, there, and there. <laughs> like over there, like they're staying with you, and all of their stuff, right? And when I say it out loud, it all sounds the same, right? This is the audience participation part. <laughs> yes, yes, okay, good. I didn't know I was gonna ask for that, but it seemed right. Um, <laughs> and so to me, I'm just like, I'm just kind of baffled that that would be something that you would really be looking for in a partner. So say like, how this works out is you have like, anybody else get bit a lot? I should have worn pants. Okay. Yeah, I know. I've got this like really organic bug spray that doesn't work at all. Because it's like water and it like, <laughs> and like a few spritzes of lemon. It's the same thing as the water stuff back there, I think, probably. Um, but it was only like $13.99 at Lucky's, so. <laughs> Uh, so, so basically, like you, you, you go out on this date, right? And this person has excellent grammar skills, and it's like one of those one percent chances where you actually have a good time on like one of these center dates, right? And then, um, you know, you start going out for a while, and you both realize that you're just really tired of swiping, so you get married um, because that's like the next step, right? And then you start doing the stuff that you're supposed to do, right? Which is like, let's go get a house, right? And we're going to get a better job. And then we're going to move to the suburbs or Clintonville or somewhere cool like that, right? I don't know where we are actually. What's this? Huh? Are we in Clintonville now? Okay, good. I didn't, I didn't mean for that to be part of the joke. Um, I'm not making fun of Clintonville. It's cool. It, it's cool here. It's cool here. No, I live like on at North Campus, but it's like really close to Clintonville, so I just tell people Clintonville, so I seem cool, because like nobody wants to like live in North Campus. Um, and uh, so basically, you go on these dates at works. So you go, you go, you get married, you get the house right, and then all of a sudden you're like thinking one day, it's like, oh, it might be cute to have some mini me's, right? And I know I was gonna kind of like choke when I said mini me's, because don't say that. I don't like, I don't like that. Um, but you decide to have some children, right? And then you, you and your spouse, you guys are creating the story together, right? This time it's like you're both creating the story. And you've got this vision about the future and you're, you know, you're working really hard and you've got this family and you feel pretty happy, right? But then sometimes you don't feel that happy and you just watch TV and people on TV seem happy because they have all this cool stuff. So then you just keep getting more and more stuff and you feel happy for a little bit. And then after a while, you're not as happy. So you just keep getting more and the kids get older and the kids get older, right? And you're working really hard for this vision and this story. Um, and then one day, your spouse is just like, I'm done with the story, right? And they don't want to be a part of that story anymore. Um, it's just not in their game plan. And, and it could be for any reason. Like, maybe they read a book, right, by somebody. <laughs> and, or just anything. Like, we can't stop people from changing. We can't stop change from happening. Although, as a culture, we've done a pretty good job of trying um, People are inevitably going to change. Things are going to happen. We're going to grow in different ways, right? And so in that moment, you know, when she looks at you, you got the kids screaming in the background in this house that you really can't afford and you're working really, really hard to be able to pay for. And she says, I'm not going to live here anymore. I'm going over there. These kids, they're staying with you. And because you're the primary breadwinner, the court's going to order that now you have to pay for all their stuff. And so in that moment... I don't think I'm gonna be thinking about grammar, right? <laughs> Even if she did use it correctly, right? Also, that wasn't my story at all. That didn't happen to me. Um, or Pete, neither of us had kids. Also, quick PSA. If someone is going through a divorce and they don't have children, don't say, at least you didn't have any children. Because that's really shitty to say. It's not, there's no joke to that. I just wanted to let you all know that. No. <laughs> also, watch Brene Brown's empathy video. And read a book on empathy. So, um, yeah, that was kind of fun.
just let it sit there for a second. Um, so the third thing that me and Pete had in common was this idea of like, he's really anxious. And I think probably if you're watching me right now, you probably realize like, well, he's not really that anxious, right? Um, I don't, I'm not really anxious, I just worry a lot, right? It's not anxiety, I just kind of worry about most things and, and everybody and like life, right? But it's not, it's not anxiety, Pete's got it a lot worse than I do. Um, but I was trying to figure out how was I going to like wrap this all together, right? I had all these different random stories about things going on and I couldn't figure out like what was I going to do to make it into like a cohesive story so that people would like understand it and, and then everybody would sort of like love me and praise me and give me all this affection and think like, man, well, you're really cool. Like maybe come and hang out with us and talk to us and maybe we'll text you or something. Um, I mean, you can if you want to. Uh, but I couldn't figure it out, and it got to be, like, Wednesday of this week, and I'm just, like, sitting in my apartment, and I'm kind of shaking, I'm freaking out, right? And, like, um, I'm sweating really bad. It's really cold in there, and I'm just, like, sitting there, and I'm sweating, and I'm laying on my new Ikea couch, and I can just feel my armpit sweat, like, getting on the couch, and I start to worry about staining the couch, right? Um, and I'm just, my heart's beating out of my chest, and I just can't stop, and my mind's just going crazy and crazy, and, like, all these people are going to just look at you, and they're just going to stare at you, and then you're, they're not going to laugh at you, and you don't know what's going to happen, right? Um, um, and then I just did what all like visionaries, all these great scientists, all these great thinkers, the greatest writers, the greatest artists have been doing since the beginning of time whenever they're kind of stuck, right? And they can't figure out their problem. They can't get outside of themselves. I smoked a ton of weed and got really, really high and I took a walk. But that didn't really work for me because I just got super anxious and like started freaking out because of the weed and I thought these group of 16 year old girls was following me the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I saw them like across the street, right, as I was walking. And I saw that they were kind of like looking at me, right, and I'm, I'm kind of walking. And as I got closer, then they crossed over the street, which was like, for me, was a good sign that they were like gonna track me. And you could kind of just tell by the way that they looked and the way they were talking, that they were definitely like the, the daughters of some cops. And I could, I could also tell that they were probably like specially commissioned by their parents to follow around people that looked like they were a little bit high. And so that they could text their parents, they could come and swarm them. Um, that's, that's just what they look like to me. So um, I realized like I'm like looking too high and I figured I was trying to figure out why do I look so high while I'm walking, right? And, I, and so I'm trying to walk and not behind. I realized I'm smiling too much, right? Because like... I was just enjoying the walk because it was really pretty out, right? And I'm kind of smiling at people and people are like, and then and, and like, what are you smiling at? I'm like, I'm just you? Like, and uh, so I realized I got to like act a little bit more serious because like you're supposed to be a little bit miserable if you're walking, it's like 85 degrees out. You're not supposed to be enjoying yourself, right? Um, why would we do that? And so, but because I'm high, I make this like overly exaggerated serious face. It's kind of like, and I'm assuming that the girl cops behind me can like tell that I'm making a serious face even though they're behind me. And so I make this really ex serious face and I'm kind of walking, right? And then I turn and I see this uh, window, the storefront window, right? And I catch my reflection. And I see this like furry being with this scowl and this weird fur on the top of his head and this weird knot thing. And he's just making such a serious face I start cracking up out loud at myself, right? And so I'm laughing out loud and then I realize that looks really high. Um, so I quickly like cover my mouth like, and then I realized that I probably have to like come up with a reason why I covered my mouth. So I do like a fake cough, you know, <clears throat> and then I put my hand down real quick and I kind of turned to make sure that they didn't see me. Um, I could tell they were still back there though. Uh, and so what happened though, is that I realized that like when I was looking in the window that I could kind of see behind me. Right. So I could check like how close they were. And I figured that like, if I kept checking, I'd be able to tell like when they got close enough to where they were going to grab me. And so I could just run. Right, so because I really wanted to make sure that they didn't like apprehend me and then take me to prison, because um, that's what teenage girl cops do on high street, right? Uh, and so I knew that I wanted to check like every five seconds, right? Because that seemed like the right amount of time at the time. Um, and so I figured I'd just count five seconds off in my head. But when I was doing that, like I was counting so loud in my head that it got really distracting. So I figured I had to count out loud, right? So I would, so I started counting out loud as I was walking. So I was just like. One, two, three, four, five. And then, and then I would check, right? 
But I realized that's way longer than five seconds. Um, so I started talking, counting really fast because I want to make sure. So it was just like one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And was looking, re right? And so this sort of worked, though, for me. Because I could tell that they weren't really that close. And so I started calming down, right? And the weed started kicking through my body and started to feel really nice and buttery. And I see this, like, really beautiful cloud, you know, up in the sky. And I start looking at it. And I think about nature and, like, just how beautiful it is. And, and I don't even care that I'm in this culture that won't allow me to just take this plant into my body and, like, look up at the sky and just kind of be in love with everything, right? I forget about all that. Um, and in that moment, I realized that I've got my um, earbuds in, but I don't have any music playing. <laughs> it's been like 20 minutes that way. Um, so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna pick like the perfect song for this moment, right? And so I go to my phone and I look into Spotify and I click on the search and I see that I had like searched Charles Manson recently <laughs> on Spotify. And, and at the same time as I'm doing that, having that realization, I look into the, rear view, or the window here and I see myself I see the picture of Charles Manson. And at that time, I have these like very specific realizations that happen. Three that happen is, one is, um, I knew the perfect way that I was going to end this thing. Like the perfect joke, right? That it was all going to come together. And again, everybody's going to love me. Um, and then two, I kind of do look a little bit like Charles Manson sometimes. Um, and sometimes that's probably scary to people. And three, I realized that like, wow, like, I'm the creator of my own story, but also I'm this actor in my own story, and I'm also the window watching my story, right? And there's this big moment of this realization that I'm all three kind of wrapped into one. And so then I knew I had to get home and write this all down, right? Because the, I was going to forget it, um, because I was still pretty stoned. And, um, but I had to go back behind me where the girl cops were at, right? And they were following me. And so I decided, like, okay, in this moment, I'm just going to build up all this intense anger. And I'm just going to scare them, but just, like, a little bit, because I know that they're young, and I don't want to scare them too much. Just like, a, like a, just, like, a little roar that causes them to sort of, like, scurry, and then I can just dart past them and get home so I can write down all this stuff, right? Um, and so I just start thinking about all this negative stuff that's happened to me, and I feel, fill up all this rage, right? And I'm getting ready, and I'm just going to kind of just yell and be like, hey, get back, right? Because uh, that, that would probably get them. And so, so I build it up, and I jump around, and uh, there's no girls there. Uh, they either stopped following me like a mile back or I, I don't actually know if they were real at this time. Um, so anyway, I uh, stop by Lucky's and I get a bag of chips and I go home and I pour it into a big bowl and I put a bunch of spicy brown mustard on it and I eat it with a spoon and I forget the whole joke that I was going to end with. Not all that story's true. Um, I actually ate all that with a fork, but I thought the spoon would be like funnier. <laughs> all right, that's, uh, that's all I got for you. Thank you. I think we're gonna have the uh, band come up now. <laughs>